Hello, my name is Stephen Conway, and this is a Sky News exclusive. Today we have Fran Dillon in the studio, Vice President of Advancement for Estonia College. Fran, thanks for being with us today. Great to be here, Stephen. Thank you. You know, it's kind of funny. You getting a mention in the Boston Globe, that's your first appearance on the studio, but you know what? We're, ex we're happy to have you here. Um, so I'm going to talk about the article first, but, mm -hmm. but, uh, but just before I do, um, tell me a little bit more about your role as Vice President of Advancement. Okay, um, I've been at Stonehill now uh, working for 43 years. I spent the first 10 years in the admissions office and I was director of admissions. Then in 1984, I transitioned over to what we now call advancement. So the office has grown tremendously in the past 30 years and my role is to oversee uh, alumni affairs, all fundraising efforts, corporate and foundation relations, communication and media relations, uh, research and stewardship and special events. Now, that's not what I do, but I oversee that. We have just great professional people in those areas, so it's a great job. It's basically externally related. We deal with the, the public outside of Stonehill for the most part. Over the course of a week, I'll see you a couple of times on campus, and every time I see you, you're shaking somebody's hand, <laughs> giving somebody a hug, talking to somebody. <laughs> And then I see you at Stonehill events, and you're working the room, <laughs> and you're going from table to table, and you're shaking people's hands. Yeah. It's like you're the mayor on campus, <laughs> you know. So I mean, maybe maybe you don't feel like this, but wh why do you think it's such an important uh, part of the job to be such a presence on campus? Well, on campus, when we're d you know again, one of my primary responsibilities is uh, fundraising and philanthropy, and uh, people don't give to bricks and mortar. Their money might go to that, but what they give is they give to a, sex, a successful institution that's helping young men and women achieve their goals. So if I'm going to be outside talking to people about investing in Stonehill and in its students, I feel like I need to know more about the students at Stonehill. It's been a long time since I've been a student at Stonehill. Mm -hmm. So it's important in my role to, to get to know students and their stories their hopes and plans for the future, and then translate that into talking to alumni and friends about how they can help make these dreams become a reality by investing in scholarships or, or uh, business buildings or uh, hope trips or athletics or the library. So uh, it's, it's a real fun part of my job, that's for sure. So let's talk about this article. Small gifts yield big rewards. Yes. So your role in this permanent fund, uh, which allows students to uh, be able to benefit from the fund uh, for a small economic crisis, mm -hmm. I imagine that that wasn't, wasn't initially part of your job description. So kind of tell me a little bit more about how you kind of fell okay. into this role. Well, in a sense, uh, if you think of my job description, it's to attract philanthropic resources to help Stonehill uh, make sure that its mission gets fulfilled. And I would say that Father John has this deep commitment to make sure that Stonehill has the resources so that young men and women who really want to be here will not be denied because they don't have the financial resources to be here. So over his tenure as president and even his, his predecessors, Father Mark and Father Bartley, we've really emphasized growing our scholarship dollars to help students come to Stonehill. So what we've found over the years is that we've done a much better job of providing the resources to make it affordable for students to be here. But then, and it sort of happened um, anecdotally, because people on campus know that my office is responsible for raising funds, I would get a call from a professor or resident director or somebody in the financial aid office who said, you know, we've expended all of our funds, but we have this person here the first case I can remember coming to me a number of years ago was a young woman who was number one in the chemistry class at Stonehill, but didn't have the money to apply to graduate schools in chemistry. And she was number one in the class. So to apply, I think, was $150 back there. This was a few years ago. And I said, well, we can't invest in a student over four years and then say, well, sorry, we can't help you apply to chemistry school. So. Um, what we did in those days is I would call an alum that I knew and say, and probably somebody who was in the sciences, in this case it was somebody who was definitely in the sciences, and say, hey, can you help this student? So that was sort of the anecdotal way we did this in the past. 
And then what happened, and more and more of these cases happened over the past few years. Then what happened is we got a very, very generous bequest from not even the alum, but was somebody who was a longtime friend of the college who passed away. And in their estate, they left Stonehill $117,000. So when that came in, I sat down with Father John and I said, you know, instead of case by case trying to go out and find somebody to give us the $700 or the $1,200 or the $300, what if we started this fund and used that to help students along the way? And Father John thought it was a great idea because of all people on this campus, he's the one that hears from families and students about obstacles and, and uh, financial obstacles. So we established this fund and uh, we called it the Bridge Fund. And uh, I think for two reasons, because the Stonehill Bridge has sort of become an iconic symbol of the college, you know, sort of uniting the residence area mm -hmm. with the rest of the campus. But the other meaning is that uh, a bridge helps you get from one place to another. And in this case, uh, without the bridge, these people don't have the, these students don't have the financial resources to get from one place to the other. So we call it the Bridge Fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how it got started. There have been a numerous amount of students who have been fortunate enough to benefit from this fund. Yes. But there seems to be one person who holds a special place in your heart. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about Juan Lopez. So uh, Juan certainly does hold a special place in my heart. I met Juan uh, when he was a senior in high school, almost by accident. We were having an alumni reception in Chicago at the home of an alumna. And we decided almost at the last minute, in addition to alumni, we would invite parents of current students and parents and students who had been accepted into the college. We couldn't invite current students because they were already on campus mm -hmm. studying. This was in the spring. So there were about three students from Chicago that came uh, with their parents, and Juan came with his father. So that was my first occasion to meet Juan. His family really wanted to stay close to home. They, did, they, would, they just felt they would miss him terribly if he came all the way to Stonehill. So I met him then, and then he sort of went out of my mind. And, uh, he decided to come to Stonehill because he got a, a very good scholarship. He was valedictorian of his class. And he researched Stonehill and he wanted to go to a school that had an excellent business program. Uh, and one of their benefactors at his high school paid for him to come to see Stonehill. And he fell in love with the campus, but he also uh, ran into two Stonehill st students, Thomas Noah and Austin Alfredson. And they were his hosts for the weekend. Those are two great guys. Two great guys, and Juan just felt like he belonged at Stonehill. So then, uh, toward the end of his, and quite frankly, he and I hadn't connected since that meeting in Chicago. One time I was going into the dining commons, and he was coming out, and he recognized me and said, do you remember me? And at first, you know, I knew I had met him, and he said, Chicago. As soon as he said that, I remembered that's where we had met. Well, he spent two summers on campus, one working for s facilities, and last summer I hired him as an intern in my office. And he did a lot of work as we prepare for this big capital campaign. So I got to know him personally. Uh, I met his brother when Father John and I went back to Chicago, and uh, we've become good friends. Um, and I would say that um, one of the things that Juan has done since he's been here, he's a very good student, but it's a compliment to the Stonehill community because his best friends are people on the tennis team and the track team, he, and he lives with a lot of them. And they've really, really made him part of their group. And I think he had a hard time adjusting to Stonehill when he first arrived. He felt like he was so different. But now he's found that Stonehill people embrace everybody, and he's really thriving here now. That's right. So what do you see moving forward this fund progressing into? Okay. So, I mean, how, how do you want this fund to benefit students in the future? Well, what we'd like to do is because, as I mentioned to you before, Stephen, it's only, only anecdotally that somebody picks up the phone and calls me and says, is there any way you can help this student? So it might be somebody whose computer broke in the middle of the semester and just doesn't have the funds to buy a computer. It might be a student who, who uh, doesn't have the money to come back to Stonehill to pay for the airfare if they live a distance away. One of the things that has come up a number of times is uh, students whose uh, one of the parents lost their insurance. Maybe they lost their job too, but they lost the insurance. And Stonehill, like all colleges, requires students to have insurance. So that's about a $2,000 uh, 
expense that the families just can't come up with. So we've been able to help some students who couldn't afford the insurance and would otherwise have dropped out of school, even if they got a very healthy financial aid package. This, this proved an insurmountable obstacle to them. So um, what we'd like to do is to have enough money in the fund so that more people in the Stonehill community know about it, whether it's a resident director or a faculty member or a coach um, or a custodian or somebody that would meet a student and find out there's a problem with some financing in their life that is not a huge, it's not like a full scholarship. It's, it might be a few hundred dollars, it might be a couple of thousand dollars. And to have more people bring that to our attention. So at the same time, what we have to do is grow the fund. So that what the commitment I made to Father John is that let's always replenish the $117,000. So if we spend $17,000, it means we have to go find donors to replenish that. Well, I must say the reaction, and primarily to the Globe article, uh, and also it's something that we did in the Monday morning update and we, we sent out to trustees, that's generated such a positive response that we've had complete strangers send money to Stonehill to put into this fund. So instead of worrying about replenishing the 117,000, I think re right now we have about 150,000 in the fund. So, but th you know, the needs will grow as people become more aware of this, so we wanna continue to ask donors to help us. And what I find, especially when we talk to alumni, when somebody helped them while they were here, it might have been financial, but it might have been with advice or an internship or whatever it was, that they wanna in turn help a current Stonehill student, and this is a very practical way to help, help students. So it's, uh, it's a great part of, uh, of what I do because I see generous alumni wanting to help students who, who have some, some financial need at the moment. That's so, incredible. Yeah. It's incredible and it's a, it's a fascinating project and I wish you the best of luck with it. Thank you. So, easy part's over, now it's the hard <laughs> part. So as we always like to end our Sky News interviews, uh, we like to end them with a lightning round of sorts. So it's a kind of a speed round. Okay. So we're gonna start off with a six pack of favorite questions. Okay. And then we're gonna kind of go in depth and, and go a little more personal. So sure. it's just uh, questions that um, kind of open up the, the Fran Dillon that yeah. Stonehill may <laughs> not have known previously. Good. All right, All so right. Let's here see we go. How we do. Favorite part of the job? Definitely working with our alumni. Favorite part of campus? Standing at the foot of the hill and looking up at Donahue Hall. Favorite part of Boston? I'd have to say three. The North End for food, the Seaport District for just the beauty of being down in the water, and Brighton, which is a neighborhood in Boston where I grew up, Sweet. and it's home to me. Awesome. Favorite food? Pizza. Genre music? Uh, I'd say 50s and 60s. I'm very e eclectic. Uh, I, have, uh, I listen to music a lot in the office. It helps me relax and de-stress, and I use it when I'm in the, in the gym, um, but it's all kinds of, you know, I, I love Bruce Springsteen, I love the Eagles, I love the Beatles, but I also love Frank Sinatra and Andy Williams, so it's... Wide range. Wide range. That's the way to yeah. do it. How about movie, favorite movie? To Kill a Mockingbird. You know, my daughter is 30 years old next week, and for probably in her, when she started watching movies, say she was eight, nine, or 10, she thought To Kill a Mockingbird was a Christmas movie because we always watched it on Christmas <laughs> Eve. <laughs> Great movie. So if you could sit down and have a cup of coffee with anybody of your choosing, alive or deceased, who would it be and why? Well, I will sit down with anybody for a cup of coffee because <laughs> I love coffee, especially Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> um, you know, it would probably be my dad. Um, he was a great guy. Uh, and he, he lived to be in his early 70s, but uh, he never met, um, well, he met my son who was very young at the time and never met my daughter. Uh, and now I have a granddaughter and he's never met her. And I think it'd be great to sit down and talk with him about what's happened in all, I'm one of five and uh, we're a very close family. And there's a lot of children, a lot of grandchildren in the family and I'd just love to be telling him about the children and the grandchildren. I think that would be great fun for me. Now, you know, after we finished coffee with my dad, it'd be John Kennedy and Jesus, and maybe not in that order, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> two of my heroes. <laughs> Best advice someone has given you? Oh, um, 
You know, I don't remember who gave me this advice, and it could have been one of the nuns I had in school, but um, I actually have it on an index card uh, under my blotter in my office, and it says, do good even when nobody's watching. And I think if you do that, you're doing good. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> And we have to end off with this. Best Stonehill moment to date. Can I do two? Sure. Uh, because I'd get in trouble if I didn't do the first one. Okay. I met my wife at Stonehill. Oh. <laughs> in uh, July of 1975, and we were married in November of 1979, and she still works here. So we've been on this campus a combined 85 years together. Wow. So, <laughs> so that would be it. But you know what? Um, the moment that sticks in my mind was Father John's inauguration, and it sticks in my mind for two reasons. Um, I took, you know, I've been here a long time, so I know a lot of alumni, but were you at the inauguration? I was, yes. Okay. We had banner holders for every class at Stonehill, mm -hmm. from, the, from the most recent class, which would have been 2013, if I'm not mistaken, back to the first class in Stonehill's history in 1952. So we had two representatives of every class up until 2013. And I stood there with, uh, with the uh, division heads as they walked by with their banners. And I knew every one of the banner holders from 1952 to 2013. Wow. So that, to see them all like that was amazing. But even more amazing uh, was, um, and actually when the, when the class of 52, the two guys from the class of 52, turned the corner and walked up the aisle, there was a standing ovation, which was just amazing. But the most amazing thing is when Father John, who's one of the most humble people I've ever met in my life, walked into the sports complex and 3,000 people were on their, on their feet. It was just wonderful. It's incredible. Yeah. Fran, thank you so much for being with us today. A pleasure, Stephen. Really thank you. I really appreciate one of my favorite people much. on campus, so I'm glad <laughs> I got to kind. interview you. I appreciate it. So Thank for you. more interviews, just like the one I just did with Fran, please tune into our YouTube channel at the Summit Newspaper Video. Thanks for being with us.